And now without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today to talk about the politics of climate vulnerability in Southeast Asia and an important subject matter against the backdrop of the COP26 summit that's happening right now. Professor, sorry, Professor Pamela Makawi is a professor in the Department of Human Ecology at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, also my alma mater. For the past 25 years, her research interests have concerned human adaptation to global environmental change, broadly defined with particular expertise in biodiversity conservation and climate change in Asia. Her work focuses on individuals and households respond to changes in the physical environment and how their responses are shaped by external policies, markets, and other constraints. Most of her research combines qualitative and quantitative household level social analysis of environmental decision-making and resource use with most of her field work focusing on Vietnam. And with that, Professor, please take it away. Great, thank you so much, Neith. Let me share my screen and uh, we'll get started. Right. Great. Can we see this? Yes. All right. Terrific. I will get started. Thank you so much to all the sponsors of the talk today. I really appreciate um, the interest in the topic. And of course, it's a, a great time to be talking about climate change, given that this week is the um, annual climate conference of the parties meeting uh, in Glasgow. It just started in the last couple of days. Um, and there's been a little bit of news about Southeast Asia um, from the conference so far, which I'll, I'll get to in, in just a little bit. Um, but of course, this is a really serious matter for Southeast Asia um, because the consequences of climate change for the region have become really readily apparent over the past decade, um, ranging from intensifying hurricanes um, to increasing threats from wildfire fires in certain areas of Southeast Asia that are experiencing drought. Um, and so we're potentially talking about one of the most vulnerable areas of the world, given that numerous countries have long coastlines, large populations in low-lying areas, you know, obviously ranging from the Philippines, which regularly experiences destructive um, typhoons, to Indonesia, which has more than 50,000 miles um, of coastline that is subjected to sea level rise. So when we combine these potential um, physical changes, we also need to talk about social vulnerability as well. And within Southeast Asia, we obviously have some countries with higher development status um, than others. So countries like Laos, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, uh, East Timor in particular, um, really have challenges in adapting to climate change given their lower socioeconomic status and, and higher poverty rates. But despite all of these headlines about the impacts of climate change and the vulnerabilities in the region, there is no single agreed upon way to understand who is most vulnerable to climate change and what should be done about it. And that is the focus of my talk um, today. So I want to start in terms of the talk today, talking a little bit about the different definitions and concepts of vulnerability that are used in Asia, um, talking a little bit about this fact that there is no consensus on what should be used. Um, and essentially, the reason why there's no consensus is that essentially any type of vulnerability assessment is to some degree subjective and contextual because it depends on what indicators are used, what data is available, and how the assessments themselves are analyzed and mobilized. So given that such comparisons of vulnerability are potentially subjective, they can also be highly political, and hence the, the title of my talk today, The Politics of Vulnerability. So for example, vulnerability assessments can allow countries to claim what anthropologist David Hughes here at Rutgers has called a quote victim slot as suffering from climate impacts without a harder look at their own potential culpability in uh, causing the problem in the first place. So it's often common to find countries presenting climate vulnerability as something um, that has been imposed upon them from outside forces beyond their control without paying attention to the ways in which um, the internal decision-making around development 
has played out and perhaps contributed to that vulnerability. The failures to include future climate risks and vulnerability in current development decision making is a problem for most countries in the world, you know, including here in the United States, but it's especially acute in fast growing but climate vulnerable countries of Southeast Asia. And so that's what I really wanna focus in on today. Um, I hope to use the talk to highlight some of these problems in the region. And I'll have a specific focus on Vietnam, which is the country I uh, work in the most and know the best. Um, and Vietnam, of course, is particularly cited as a particularly vulnerable country because it has large populations living in coastal and low-lying areas, um, particularly the Mekong Delta in the south, where nearly half of the land area is around one meter um, above sea level. So we have those vulnerabilities in the Delta. We also have longstanding vulnerabilities to hurricane and flood risk in the central part of Vietnam. Um, and uh, you know, we need to think about all those different exposures um, that Vietnam uh, is facing. And so I'll talk a little bit about those in particular. Um, and then I'll talk about how climate finance in particular and, and financial risks um, are being structured when we talk about um, Vietnam. Because Vietnam continues to have large numbers of people who are vulnerable to climate change because of an unwillingness to rethink some of the current development trajectories. Um, and that's what I'll um, talk about towards the end, um, particularly around this idea of climate resilient development paths. Um, and this is a term that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, our major assessment body that issues reports every few years in which uh, I've been privileged enough to be a lead author with. Um, in the 1.5 degrees uh, report that came out in 2018, they labeled the idea that we should restructure development planning to be climate resilient and also to contribute to climate mitigation. Um, and I wanna talk about whether or not that's happening in Southeast Asia. Uh, and what the political reality around this is. Um, overall, the situation I think really begs the question, if countries that are concerned about being victims of climate change are doing enough themselves to avoid creating the conditions by which people become vulnerable. Um, and then I'll conclude the talk and hopefully we'll have plenty of time um, for Q&A at the end um, of the uh, presentation. So, like all social concepts, vulnerability is really um, oops, is in the eye of the beholder. Um, so there's really no agreed upon way to measure vulnerability, although we do have this broad definition of vulnerability that the IPCC um, has put forth, that vulnerability is a function of exposure to climate risk, the sensitivity of different uh, populations to that risk, and their adaptive capacity to deal with it, to bounce back um, from climate risk and events. Um, so within this framework, exposure is generally understood as the presence of population, of assets and resources where a hazard might occur um, or which might potentially be affected, such as say homes that are built um, along a coast that's experiencing sea level rise. So sensitivity describes the way that harm might be felt by different populations unevenly, unevenly and unequally, such as the poor who might have um, problems adapting or the inability to say raise their houses to avoid flood risks. And then adaptive capacity has been defined as the ability to manage, absorb or bounce back um, after these stressors. So when we talk about physical exposure in Southeast Asia, um, we're often talking about multiple um, potential risks. Uh, and this is a, a, a visual from the Working Group 2 report from the IPCC. The most recent one will be coming out later next year in 2022. This is from the 2014 report. So uh, a little bit dated at this point, um, but it's the best we have. And, the key problems that have been identified for Southeast Asia include obviously temperature change, um, rising levels um, of heat. That's a particular concern for countries that have 
large numbers of agricultural laborers that work outside, um, cities that experience um, the sort of double whammy of rising temperatures plus urban heat island effects from the built environment, a sort of lack of um, air conditioning or shelters or places to go on, high, on hot days in a lot of these cities. Um, we also obviously have real risk from precipitate, precipitation changes. Um, drier dry seasons, wetter wet seasons, and particularly unpredictable um, precipitation events that often lead um, to localized flood risks. So these are some of the physical exposures that we know for sure Southeast Asia uh, is facing. There's also the question of the social um, uh, vulnerabilities. Sorry, the thing keeps skipping slides. I'll have to sort of remember what I have uh, and not skip ahead. Um, so talking about physical uh, exposure, Vietnam in particular, because it's a country that has um, a very long sort of stretched out geographic shape, um, has a lot of different physical exposures. And these are things that planners there um, have to potentially start accounting for when making development decisions. And these range from flash floods um, in mountainous areas of Vietnam, particularly in the north, um, storms and floods, sea level rise and storm surges all along the coast, um, increasing risk, for example, in, in the Mekong Delta, the southern part of the country, um, if hurricanes start tracking further south, which they traditionally have not. They have traditionally hit basically the central and northern coast, but we may see more um, tracking south as a possible consequence of climate change. We also have risk of droughts, um, both in the Mekong Delta and the lowlands, but also in some of our highland areas. This would affect major um, export crops like coffee, um, rice, and so forth. So we have some real physical risks in Vietnam. We also have um, the need to really think about um, how we're going to um, measure uh, different aspects of vulnerability. So we could potentially think about, um, you know, for simplicity's sake, one or two single data points to think about uh, ways to measure uh, vulnerability to these physical exposures. So a very common single data point is, of course, economic damage. Um, this is often assessed after the fact in terms of uh, particular climate events and then extrapolated forward in terms of what future risk might be. So very common to see something like the figure on the left where we're estimating total economic damage from particular events. Um, and then also in some cases, uh, estimating the percentage of GDP to give a, a sense of the, the scale of the particular risk um, to wholesale economies. We also could potentially take a single indicator like deaths, deaths per capita, as you see in the, the figure on the right, um, which comes from a report that was looking at um, risk across a number of natural disasters, floods um, in particular in Vietnam, um, and showing provinces that had higher deaths um, per capita. So these can be you know, useful, but they are single, essentially single indicators of vulnerability. And so um, they don't tell us the whole picture. And so there's been a real interest in trying to develop multiple uh, indicators of vulnerability that can be combined together to give us that sort of broader sense um, of risk. Um, and so the potential ways to do this um, are very complicated. And there's no, as I said, there's no sort of single way to do this across Southeast Asia. Um, so depending on the study, different indicators of sensitivity and adaptive capacity um, are often used. So for example, um, uh, you know, some studies have looked at um, uh, things that have been pulled from the wider literature in terms of things that might uh, contribute to vulnerability, this, this sort of sensitivity that can range from human resources, you know, what are the literacy rates? Um, this may affect people's ability to understand um, uh, climate risk warnings, for example. Uh, what's the life expectancy anyway? You know, are there already other factors contributing to higher mortality rates? Um, what's the infrastructure like? Um, things like housing, that's going to affect one's sensitivity to flood and to hurricane damage. Um, what are some economic metrics that might be affecting uh, uh, overall sensitivity, particularly you know, 
measured through sort of uh, general standards like gross domestic product per capita or income per capita, or even measures of inequality through say um, GD indexes. There's also the physical vulnerability itself, even though that is really more about the exposure, oftentimes that physical vulnerability is taken as, as a measure of sensitivity as well, such as access to water resources, or there's been a change under various measures of climate risk. Um, adaptive capacity, the indicators are, are really even more variable. Um, so one recent report on Southeast Asia, you see the, the map on the right, right? That's it's a decade ago now. Um, used a number of different indicators of adaptive capacity. Um, these have ranged from education, poverty incidents, um, income inequality, um, access to electricity and infrastructure and so forth, um, ability to communicate, how, how good the communication lines are. Um, and as you can see by the overlaps between these two categories though, um, Understanding how sensitivity might be different from adaptive capacity and how they're related has been a challenge. Um, so has collecting the right data on the ground um, in order to understand this. Um, and combining these multiple indicators together is also a challenge. How do you weight the various ones? Um, but it's very common to see maps like the, the one I have on this slide that try to give you a sense of the relative um, problems of vulnerability across regions. Um, and so part of this comparative vulnerability is trying to understand um, how countries rank globally. So in addition to maps, we often get rankings of vulnerability. And people want to see, you know, what, what countries are going to be most affected. This can affect decisions about climate financing and so forth. Um, so it's very common to see maps like the one I have here that use only physical uh, vulnerability, that exposure um, part of the equation to give this sense of, of overall vulnerability. And so you often see maps like who's going to be affected by sea level rise based on um, total populations or percentage of the population. So these are two ways to think about sea level rise, for example, for just thinking in terms of sheer numbers of people, um, obviously countries that have, have bigger populations um, and have long coastlines are potentially at risk. Um, and so this sort of exposure approach is, is relatively common, um, but they don't really give us a good sense of the complexities of social vulnerabilities. And so we have a number of um, different organizations that have tried to do these sort of rankings and indexes of exposure. Um, so one that's fairly well known is the Climate Vulnerability Monitor um, that's been done by an NGO based in Spain, um, which sums up a number of indicators, both in terms of overall risk to populations, which are in the left-hand column, and then the potential costs um, of adapting to what the various um, risks per country are. And you can see this as a, a two columns having um, a comparison of different countries in Asia with red being countries that are potentially um, more vulnerable than others. So you can see here um, in terms of sheer populations on the left-hand column, obviously Cambodia uh, and China uh, are, are seen to be at more risk um, than some of the other countries uh, in Asia. So this is, this is one way to do it. Of course, you always have to look and see, you know, what indicators that they actually use. So these only present the rankings and, and I haven't drilled in into the, the indicators, but we can talk about those in, in Q&A. Um, another uh, ranking and, and index approach uh, that, that's used and commonly referred to is the um, Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative or Indy Gain. Um, and it's another example of these ranked indexes um, that try to assess how, how country, how prepared they are to deal with um, adaptation. Do they have the financial resources and so forth? Um, and they can end up, you know, having a very different uh, ranking for different countries because they're using different indicators. So in this case, um, I've just pulled the sort of uh, lower ends from Indy Gain for Southeast Asia. And you can see that Indonesia, Vietnam are kind of in the middle of the pack. Uh, East Timor, Philippines ranked as a little bit less um, ready to adapt. And then Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar in particular, uh, ranking very low uh, on this index. So indicating that they're not not prepared um, for the adaptation that's going to be needed um, to try to alleviate some of the potential risks and harms um, from climate change. 
Um, but as I said, because these indexes use different indicators, a country can wind up in very different places in these rankings. So for example, a ranking that focuses just on physical exposure alone can put Vietnam very high. So for example, Vietnam has been ranked as one of the top five countries in the world um, that's most exposed to sea level rise. Um, in this ranking, you can see Vietnam's kind of middle of the pack um, in terms of adaptive capacity. Um, and so these sort of shifts in where the rankings are give us a sense of, of the, you know, essentially subjective measures that go into um, the indexes themselves. And it really requires us to drill down into these to figure out what is actually being assessed. Because sometimes these rankings are not, they shouldn't be taken as the whole story. Um, the other question is, of course, um, the challenges that are embedded in this ranking approach and the, the use of these indexes. So others have talked about how difficult it is to capture with single, particularly quantitative measures, um, things that we think might affect risk and adaptive capacity, like good governance. How do we boil that down to a single quantitative indicator? Um, many people have tried, um, but does it really tell us what we think it tells us is a question that we have to ask ourselves. There's of course, you know, anytime we try to do an index, we have to try to figure out to weight the indicators where all the indicators weighted exactly the same. Is your poverty rate essentially equivalent to your level of road coverage? How are these weighted? Are some more important than others? Um, for Southeast Asia, a particular challenge is actually collecting the data to reflect the indicators. So it's fine and good to say that you're going to um, have an indicator that tells us about communications networks, but how are we actually gonna collect that data? Some countries in Southeast Asia have strong regular census and they do collect this data even down to, um, you know, in, uh, down to the subnational level fairly regularly. Other countries do not. And so we have a real variability in the underlying data itself. And then of course, there's the dynamic nature of vulnerability, right? We wanna potentially know it, what's going on over time and shifts and change versus these single snapshots that we might get from, from these rankings at one point in time. So we've got a lot of challenges um, and it gives us a sense of the fact that there's no clear standard on what vulnerability is. There's not likely to be one. Um, and so the, the decision of which index to use, which measure of vulnerability to use, which indicators to use can become political. Um, so some countries, for example, use their, their rankings um, to attract donor support uh, and advocate for certain positions. So for example, the prime minister of Vietnam called for an international fund of the five most um, affected countries by sea level rise after a World Bank report came out in 2007 that used physical exposure to sea level rise um, to rank these countries. And you can see this is a map um, from that report. Um, and then on the right, a bar graph, which shows globally uh, what countries were considered to be most impacted in terms of population numbers. Okay, so it's a, a exposure and population approach. Um, but Vietnam used it as a chance to lobby um, Egypt, Bangladesh, Egypt, Suriname, some of these other countries about getting together and advocating for um, adaptation funding. Um, Vietnam was also an early joiner of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a group of 40 uh, at-risk countries that advocate for stronger global action at the, the global level. Um, they've lobbied for increased donor funding uh, and um, use this as, as a negotiating position at um, conferences of the parties like the one that's going on this week and next um, in Glasgow. So therefore there's some political capital in being seen as climate vulnerable. But the danger is even within these coalitions, um, how different countries represent their vulnerability can lead to jockeying even between countries that have agreed that they are vulnerable. Um, so Vietnam, for example, emphasizes one aspect of their vulnerability, which is the high population numbers exposed and the percentages of arable land that will be affected. So physical vulnerability exposures, um, ones that are particularly relevant to them because they are a country with a large population. And they emphasize that that will vault them ahead of say, for example, other countries like small island states 
like um, Tuvalu, who is also in the climate vulnerable forum, because those small island states have smaller overall populations. They're just smaller in size. Um, but the small island nations have pushed back because they have said, OK, their populations may be smaller in size, but the percentages of their populations that will be affected are much higher, right? If we're talking about islands in which um, the entire island is close to one meter uh, above sea level, we're talking about you know, 80, 90% of a population that might potentially be um, at risk. So what to emphasize in these vulnerability measures can become contested ground, and it cannot be reduced just to simple neutral or scientific measures. Um, because the choices of what indicators we use reflect values around what is important. And of course, these decisions also affect access to global climate financing. And so that is one measure of this politics of vulnerability. Um, we have different climate funds. We have the Green Climate Fund. We have the Adaptation Fund, both of which distribute billions of dollars of pledged assistance um, to mostly developing countries. Um, to tackle climate change. And they have to use these some sort of measure um, in terms of determining where they're gonna send their money. So the adaptation fund, for example, uses criteria um, of quote, level of vulnerability, level of urgency and adaptive capacity among others. But the countries that apply to the adaptation fund usually self-identify their levels of vulnerability using their own criteria. So it makes it pretty hard to compare um, across these applications. And as many researchers have shown, some of the decisions of these funds are more political than not, often including basing decisions about fundability of, product, of projects on the ability of countries to use money wisely, not on some sort of comparative vulnerability level. So given this, it's easier to see why some climate funds go to some countries and not others. So these are uh, uh, mapping of adaptation projects in Asia. You can see, for example, the Philippines. The Philippines gets um, hammered. Hurricanes regularly has not been funded for adaptation fund um, projects. Um, and this is of last year. There's also the Green Climate Fund. The Green Climate Fund funds both mitigation and adaptation. So, so it's a little bit different than the adaptation fund. Um, and in this case, Asia just ed edges out Africa in terms of the region with the most number of funded projects um, by 64 to 63. And within Asia, we see variability as well. I put Southeast Asia in the, the, the top list here and, and for comparison's sake, other countries in Asia. Um, so you see a place like Mongolia has received very large amounts of funding um, from the Green Climate Fund, 262 million versus a country like Myanmar. Um, which we also know is equally, or not equally, I should say, is, is also climate vulnerable in their own way, um, but has received much lower amounts of funds. Um, and so a lot of these decisions um, are, they don't seem to have any relationship <laughs> to those indexes of vulnerability that I showed earlier. And so, um, you know, what good are some of these indexes that researchers and NGOs have produced, given that these funding decisions appear to be an entirely different calculus sometimes, um, one that is also political and subjective. So of course, there's also a potential hazard is in being seen as too vulnerable. And that's another aspect of the politics of vulnerability. So if a country is seen as too hazardous or too likely to experience harm, that might impact economic trajectories, then foreign direct investment, such as where to build factories or expand agricultural development, might be directed someplace else that is less vulnerable. Um, these perceptions of higher risk can also potentially affect um, sovereign credit ratings, which is a real concern for countries that have high level of indebtedness um, uh, because it affects their ability to borrow and pay back money. So Moody's, for example, which rates the fiscal strength of um, different government entities in different areas of the globe, released a report in 2020 stating that sea level rise in particular was likely to affect the credit worthiness of major countries like Vietnam. So sea level rise could cause lost income, damage to infrastructure and other assets, or force out migration such that countries would lose tax revenue or become over indebted to deal with the impacts of climate change and thus not be able to repay um, borrowing that happened in other sectors. 
So if countries' sovereign debt credit scores change due to concerns about risk, the interest rates by which they borrow are likely to go up, potentially costing additional billions and extra fees. Um, and that, for example, has been seen um, as a particular problem for Vietnam. Um, the flood impacts, salinity impacts could all spiral into potential risks to not only their credit ratings, um, but their ability to pay back um, any outstanding loans or future loans. So for Vietnam, the, the politics of risk is really especially acute in the Mekong Delta. Because the most dire projections of sea level rise and land subsidence um, mean that large areas of the Delta are likely to be subject to regular floods, if not permanent inundation later this century. So much of the Delta, which is home to nearly 22 million people, um, may not be where financial um, companies and advisors and so forth may want to build long-term investments. And that might imperil Vietnam's development planning in which the Delta and Ho Chi Minh City are seen as major drivers of growth. And it's clear that such thinking influenced Vietnam's reaction to a report by Climate Central um, in fall 2019. And it's worth talking a little bit about what happened um, because it gives us a sense of the politics of vulnerability. So this report used new methodologies to extrapolate elevation in relation to sea level rise using satellites and found that many areas of the world were at lower elevations than initially thought and thus were even more susceptible to the impacts of sea level rise. So a New York Times article that accompanied this um, Climate Central report um, used dramatic maps of high tides in the future and declared in the body of the article that by 2050, quote, Southern Vietnam could all but disappear, unquote. The story caused great concern in Vietnam, but the response was less about the implications of increased flood risk for populations and more about the political implications of such a finding. So when a, within a day of the New York Times report, an official rebuke came out from the director, de, uh, deputy director of Vietnam's um, Institute of Meteorology, Hydrology and Climate Change. Um, the scientists noted that the Climate Central report was based on overly extreme long-term scenarios, so high-end, um, high emission scenarios, and could not be better than data that was um, provided by the Vietnam government, uh, in her words. Um, and so as a result, Vietnam officials pushed the idea that it was unscientific because it didn't use data that had been collected in Vietnam by Vietnamese scientists. Um, and because it had those projected levels of sea level rise to be closer to two meters rather than one meter that they saw was more likely to happen under the more realistic um, emission scenarios. There was also a strong feeling that Vietnamese scientists and their data should have been involved. Um, so there's a bit of, of hurt pride as well. Um, and government officials particularly objected to the New York Times word use of the word disappear. Um, which had been translated into Vietnamese as bị um, soi, so disappear, wiped out, with regard to the Vietnam Delta. So Vietnamese newspapers, this was the initial story about the um, uh, report from Climate Central. So Ho Chi Minh City, um, you know, could be um, essentially lost, um, could be at risk of frequent flooding, um, and the uh, response a few days later was really interesting. So this came out on, on October 31st, that Ho Chi Minh City is really at risk um, of being lost um, by underneath uh, uh, risk of inundation. Um, uh, the next day, or not, not exactly the next day, but a couple of days later, um, the researchers from Climate Central were interviewed by Vietnamese newspapers um, and they said um, that they would have characterized the problem in the Mekong Delta at being at risk of frequent flooding as a more accurate phrasing, not, at, not as being wiped out as the New York Times had used it. Um, so this caveat let, lent credence to the idea that Vietnam would be able to minimize the damage to the Delta, particularly through land use planning, sea dikes and other active measures. Um, and then just a couple of days later, after the, this sort of um, rethinking of the wording of the Climate Central Report, um, the Prime Minister of Vietnam was quoted as saying, the projections for the dangers, the risks to the Mekong Delta by 2050 have no basis in reality. So we went very quickly um, through different stages of reaction to this report 
And so Prime Minister Fook addressed the National Assembly um, you know, within two weeks of this report coming out and strongly affirmed there's no scientific basis to include that the Mekong Delta will be submerged, that um, he emphasized that the Netherlands has much of its country level, country um, uh, area below sea level and still manages to be developed and wealthy. And that Vietnam, quote, must turn the risk from climate change from saltwater to opportunity. And to further confirm that the Vietnamese government did not believe that it was at risk of losing investments in the Mekong Delta, a number of publicly announced infrastructure projects have occurred since this report to show this confidence in a performative way. These include major new expressways between Delta cities, massive irrigation works, and big urban redevelopments, one of which I'll mention in just a second. So a final aspect of this politics of vulnerability is the way the climate risk is often presented as an external problem, which presents challenges to developing climate resilient development pathway plans. Um, and this is a term that the IPCC first used in their 1.5 degree report a couple of years ago. The idea being that if we could match development to both mitigation, that is lowering greenhouse gas emissions, in addition to dealing with adaptation and trying to achieve the sustainable development goals, we will reach a world, that lower pathway on our figure, that limits global warming, um, encourages sustainable development, and ends up having equity and well being for all. Um, but how do we actually design a climate resilient development pathway is not clear. Um, it is a nice goal, um, but the detail, the devil, of course, as with all things, is in the details. Um, and the problem, I argue, is that because a number of developing countries, Southeast Asia among them, represent vulnerability as something that's caused by others, by other high emitting and carbon producing richer countries, which is true, um, it doesn't take into account the internal choices made by countries, which often exacerbate such vulnerabilities. So this is not unusual. Climate change vulnerability can and will contradict development trajectories set by governments and few countries have comprehensive plans to actually tackle both mitigation and adaptation in their development planning. Um, and we have the particular problem that Southeast Asia and Vietnam in specific have really experienced record-breaking economic growth in the past few decades that has encouraged non-climate resilient development pathways. It's focused on concentrating assets in coastal areas and floodplains, it's concentrated investment and priority areas to small numbers of crops that can be vulnerable and climate sensitive, crops like uh, coffee and rice. Um, and in discussions with me, policymakers at the national level often discuss Vietnam's various vulnerabilities and the, the dangers um, of risk to Vietnam without talking about the decisions that have been made internally such as expanding export shrimp production at the cost of protective mangroves, um, or you know, the, the, the possibility of, of tackling, basically getting their own house in order as part of um, long-term development planning. So some of these climate unresilient development choices have included um, excessive rates of groundwater extraction in the Mekong Delta, which increases land subsidence. So when combined with sea level rise, we get an even worse problem. So rather than comprehensive planning about groundwater use, we often have excessive rates. We also unfortunately have excessive rates of sand mining along some of the Mekong Delta tributaries. Even in provinces that are already vulnerable to current river flooding, local governments will authorize sand mining and dredging along these river banks, which increases the impacts from floods and which are gonna be amplified under climate change. So these development decisions make climate risk worse. And so we have the opposite. We have climate unresilient development choices being made. So is this mindset changing? Are we seeing any differences? What's going on? Let's bring it up to the, the COP that's going on right now. Um, and we have a couple of things that are worth mentioning um, as I start to close out this talk. Um, and that is we're starting to see at least on the mitigation side, um, countries being potentially more aggressive with their own carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions. So Indonesia has pledged to be net zero by 2060. And we just found out in the last couple of days 
um, that Vietnam has pledged to be net zero by 2050, which is the, the most significant net zero goal in Southeast Asia at the moment. Um, we have a number of countries just signed on to the Global Methane Pledge, which was led by the EU and the US to tackle methane, which is a short-lived but very potent greenhouse gas. This is significant for Southeast Asia um, because of the um, potential releases of methane from the agriculture sector, rice production in particular. So this will require rethinking um, agriculture um, for Southeast Asia, for these countries that have signed on to the methane pledge and could lead to more attention to climate resilient rice production, trying to reduce methane emissions, trying to make rice more adaptive in the future. So we'll see, we'll see if these pledges lead to, to changes. Um, but I have to unfortunately just close out with one more pessimistic um, example. So despite the fact that Vietnam has just pledged net zero, by 2050, we still have development decision making that puts them at risk. Um, and the, 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 I think, prime example of this is despite this greenhouse gas emissions pledge that is so significant that I want to give kudos to Vietnam for, for pledging, um, they're also pledging to do things which negate that pledge. Um, and the biggest one to draw your attention to is the fact that Ho Chi Minh City, the largest, the largest city in Vietnam, has long benefited from about 20,000 hectares of mangroves at the mouth of the Sa Saigon River downstream um, in Kenza, which is a biosphere reserve. These mangroves slow tidal action, which when combined with sea level rise threatens flooding in the city proper, which is farther away from the coast. It's about 60 kilometers inland. Um, however, starting in just last year, in 2020, um, construction plans have been approved for a huge new suburban and tourist-oriented planned community in the mangrove belt. So this is a picture I took in 2019. Um, the planned community is this community in orange at the mouth of the mangroves. Um, and the planned community will look like that. Um, so this planned community is going to cost $9 billion, involve heavy dredging, construction of several hundred thousand homes, both endangering this natu natural buffer, but placing this new urban development at a high risk zone for future sea level rise. So if the protection of the largest city in Vietnam can be sacrificed for economic development, what hope is there for other places in Vietnam? So these problems of the politics of vulnerability are not um, unique to Vietnam, they're not unique to Asia, um, many countries are facing them. Um, and trying to systematically tackle this need um, for really transformative um, adaptation is something all countries are going to have to deal with. And managing the enormity of climate risk um, will require a decision that hard decisions need to be asked about development trajectories to protect the most vulnerable, like the ones you see here. Um, not taking action now to limit development, um, such as regulating groundwater abstraction, sand mining, where new peri-urban developments are going to be built, may mean that countries are going to face enormous costs of resettlement, um, new um, climate proofing down the road, even coastal withdrawal and retreat, as we're seeing Indonesia face right now with the decision to move the capital away from Jakarta. So we need more recognition that vulnerability is political both in how we understand the concept, how we measure it, um, and how we deal with it. Um, so how these risks are created and the ways in which development pathways are gonna structure vulnerability moving forward um, really need to be part of the consideration and not just net zero pledges. So I will leave it at that. Thanks so much um, for everyone's attention. Happy to spend a little bit of time on questions. Um, thank you to my funders uh, for, for work on this over, over many decades. Um, and I do also want to bring people's attention to a short article that I wrote um, for education about Asia, um, which is uh, available um, at the Asian Studies website. That's basically an undergraduate teaching focused article um, that summarizes some of these, ar these arguments that I've made and uh, might be a useful teaching tool. So I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, thank you to the many scientists who are working on this and the many reports that have been issued um, and uh, happy to potentially take some questions. Great, thank you, Professor, for your very insightful presentation. Um, so to our audience, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A function. And before we open it up to um, our attendees today, 
I do have a few questions to ask you, um, Professor. So as the COP26 meeting is currently underway, you showed that some of what is you know, at stake in the region and you know, you've, list, you've listed some of the announcements that have been made um, earlier this week as well. And um, so what are other key decisions that you are expecting to come out of the meeting um, that is you know, specifically relevant to Southeast Asia itself? Yeah, I don't expect um, any additional sort of big pledges. Um, those I think have tended to be earlier in the, the week to kind of match with the leaders being in town. Um, but I do expect there to be a lot more attention over the, the next couple of weeks to a couple of issues that are really relevant to Southeast Asia. So the first one is loss and damage. Um, so that is the question of um, how much responsibility should be attributed to countries that have already developed and benefited from carbon emissions, how much do they owe the other countries of the world that are experiencing impacts? Um, and can we calculate these and, and finance these somehow? Um, we have a increasingly um, strong attribution um, science around climate change, around extreme events that can say, you know, it's much more likely that X hurricane occurred because of climate change, that, that science has advanced and that has helped countries make cases for um, the sort of excess damage they're experiencing and, and can that be dealt with um, through pledges and climate financing. Um, it's, it's very controversial. Should loss and damage be included in adaptation funding that I talked about, all these different um, adaptation funds? Should it be a separate thing? Um, are there liability, legal liabilities included? Should we call these reparations? It's very politically controversial. So I expect there to be some fireworks around loss and damage over the next um, couple of weeks for sure. Um, and Southeast Asia may likely you know, play a part in that in, in, in asking for loss and damage claims. Um, I think there's probably gonna be a lot of discussion about um, the countries that aren't um, sort of upping their pledge as fast as were expected. So China, you know, the, um, the president of China is not there. Um, and so that's been criticized a little bit. Um, the U.S. is, it, it's politically unclear if the U.S. is going to be able to even meet its more ambitious pledges that President Biden made. So I think there'll be discussion around sort of, you know, show us, um, mm -hmm. actually put things, you know, don't just say words, but are, how are these things actually going to happen, particularly for countries that are pledging by 2030. So Southeast Asia is probably gonna to wanna to hold other countries um, to their pledges. But at the same time, I think we, you know, we as researchers also need to hold Southeast Asian governments to their pledges as well and make sure that some of the things they're pledging to do are actually improving um, things on the ground. And yeah, and to add on to that, you you know, despite the recognition that um, the danger of climate change poses to countries like Vietnam, as you've shown, and but officials are still prioritizing economic development that are climate unresilient in your word above all else. Um, and that could actually make them more vulnerable in the long run. And even with sustainable development goals, um, which is still emphasizing economic growth. Um, and, you know, in your opinion, do you think that Southeast Asian countries really made their climate pledge if, you know, they, 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 they can't seem to reconcile the contradiction that development causes climate change and, and vice versa. Yeah, I had a really interesting interview um, about 10 years ago when Vietnam really started developing um, its first climate adaptation plans. And um, this was before Vietnam's first mitigation uh, pledge, which happened in 2015 under the Paris Agreement. And I talked to some high ranking officials in Hanoi in particular um, with the city of Hanoi about development choices and whether or not they needed to be climate proofed and how they were thinking about that. Um, and a person at the, the Hanoi uh, Department of Planning said to me, you know, if Vietnam doesn't continue um, to, develop, uh, to develop and raise incomes, there's not going to be any money to, to invest um, in policies for climate change. So that has to be the first priority, right? We have to grow rich and then we'll have the money and then we'll use it. Um, but I think that that mindset has changed actually over the past decade. Um, and because at that time, Vietnam was also saying like, it, it's not our responsibility to deal with carbon emissions, that's for richer countries to do. Um, Vietnam is realizing it, it, it's part of Vietnam's issue as well. Um, and I give a lot of credit 
um, to Vietnam's um, climate campaigners, the NGOs in Vietnam, who have really been holding the country's leaders um, to task, particularly around coal. Um, the NGO community, the civil society in Vietnam has been very vocal that Vietnam's dependence on coal and particularly future projections of new coal-fired power plants coming online is out of line with the vulnerability of Vietnam. And I think it is due to their efforts that we are seeing a net zero pledge um, from Vietnam's uh, leadership this week. You know, it is, it is due to their pressure campaign. Um, and so I give a lot of credit to them um, for having kept that on the agenda. Now we have to look at what the energy policy, you know, what the energy plan is gonna look like, right? I mean, we have this net zero pledge. Now we actually have to put it in the targets and the timetables in the actual sectoral plans. Um, and so for Vietnam, this likely, this likely means um, no coal-fired power plants, new ones coming online. Um, and can they get financing quickly enough for renewables, um, wind in particular? Um, I, the, I, Vietnam's gonna be asking for help for that. And, and, and it is in other countries' interest to do that, um, to keep, keep coal offline for Vietnam in particular. So keeping in line with cold and energy, we have a question from C.V. Harrison. Um, his question is, do you, how do you perceive about energy transition and renewable energy optimization in tackling climate vulnerability in the region? Since most countries are still heavily, um, I think, uh, rely on fossil fuels and facing difficulties in engaging developing countries to transfer their technologies to develop clean energy as well. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt it's going to be a challenge. I think um, one good way to frame it as a vulnerability question, though, um, is to particularly around coal, um, because we know that in addition to causing greenhouse gas emissions, um, coal fired energy creates particulate emissions. Um, and in Southeast Asia in particular, um, we already have high rates of bad air quality, particularly um, uh, PM 2.5 in a lot of the cities is way outside um, the healthy range as established by say the US. Um, and so a lot of Southeast Asian cities in particular are, would, be, would, have, would be out of compliance if they were located in the US. Um, and we know that that air pollution shortens people's lives. It also makes it really uncomfortable um, to live in cities when it's when you actually see, you know, any of us who have lived in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City and other, you know, other places know what those smoggy days look like um, and having to wear your masks even prior to COVID to, to counterbalance those effects. So I think framing the shift away from fossil fuels as a vulnerability risk reduction measure around air pollution is a really smart strategy. And that's what a lot of the NGOs have been doing um, to frame it as you're not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which are causing all of these other sometimes abstract and seemingly far off um, potential effects in 2050. This is about air pollution now. This is about health effects for our kids now. And I think that's a really smart framing. Um, and I think that has contributed to countries um, uh, getting more serious about um, reductions in coal, reductions uh, or moving away from, um, uh, for example, uh, moving towards electric vehicles in cities. That'll help with um, air pollution control uh, in these cities as well. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple of questions on the funding mechanism. Um, so I will um, ask um, a question from Nabila Hawali first. And um, Nabila asks, um, Based on your findings, how successful are these funding achieved its objective through those different projects? Are the country governments um, and the ex uh, ex executing agency more in control of this fund or is it more of a donor side? Mm -hmm. it, it depends on what, yeah, which fund we're talking about. Um, you know, there's various complicated modalities, you know, who applies for the project, um, complicated. Um, and, but one of the things that a lot of this has in common is particularly like the adaptation funds, um, the green climate funds, um, a lot of donor bilateral funds and so forth is they tend to be project level um, approaches. Like it's a five-year project to reduce coastal vulnerability through um, education, uh, you know, improving uh, roofing, you know, uh, climate proofing roofing and so forth. Um, but project-based funding is, is always has this challenge of you know, coming to an end at some point. 
Um, so if it's not channeled through sort of durable government institutions, um, that's always a risk. Um, some of these projects don't do a great job of sort of before and after assessments of vulnerability. They don't do a sort of baseline vulnerability or it's sort of very you know, quick and dirty. Um, and then at the end, it's, it's hard to say if vulnerability has actually been reduced or not. Um, and so thinking about funding streams that are more aligned with durable long-term um, you know, government priorities is helpful, but you do run the risk though of that so say, rather than having a project-based mechanism, you're gonna give 100 million um, or 1 billion to a government entity itself and say, okay, use that as part of your planning. You run the risk of, of governments funding things they wanted to do anyway. And it's not necessarily uh, you know, based on any sort of climate vulnerability measure. Um, and we see that in Vietnam. Um, so Vietnam, for example, has wanted to um, dredge some of their ports for a long time. Um, and so sometimes they'll be cast as vulnerability measures because you know we're we're worried about sea level rise so therefore we need to have more investment in ports but it was always on the table to improve ports to increase exports from the first place it just sort of becomes couched in, in vulnerability language even though it's sort of not clear how that was assessed so there's risk with with both of these with both a project-based approach and the sort of um funding mechanism that goes directly into ministries so i think um you know Civil society plays a really important role here, monitoring, you know, keeping an eye on these projects, following them, making sure they're reaching the places that are vulnerable, um, poorer areas. Um, that's kind of the best we can do, but, but it's a huge challenge. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And to the second funding question is from Bob Goodman. He's, he asked, what's the funding behind the planned city at the mouth of the Saigon River um, about methane from agriculture? Rice production is a very strong cultural issue too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts on sort of the, the simple solution to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the one at Saigon is a private, um, well, in as much as anything is, is private in Vietnam, um, it's, it's a sort of potential joint venture or it's being approved by um, some of the city authorities. And so there may be sort of under the, under the table um, questions here that I'm, I'm not privy to know about, um, but it's a private um, company that is gonna lease this land. Um, so they got the approvals from the, the city, um, which uh, that mangrove area is part of the larger Ho Chi Minh City um, area. And so, but it's going to be that that nine billion is going to be mostly private uh, investment to build that. They clearly think they're going to get their 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 money back from people who want to buy houses there. Um, but I question that calculus because if you tell people how at risk they potentially are, and if you're not building in, um, you know, high, much higher elevation for some of these plans, and you know, you're removing mangroves, and so you've got that strip of houses at the the, the mouth that has no protection whatsoever. I question whether people are necessarily gonna to wanna to move down there. So I think there's some really risky decision-making going on here. Um, I think the decision-making over agriculture investment is, is much smarter. Um, there's a lot of money going into climate smart agriculture. So um, for example, rice, um, uh, the way that rice uh, is produced in Vietnam um, often uses too much money, uh, too, too much water. Um, and so, shifting away from overly wetting, um, flooding uh, paddy fields and using less water will also reduce the methane emissions and could be cheaper for farmers. That is, they're not spending as much money on irrigation water, not as much labor potentially. Um, so I hate to call things win-win because I think there are some trade-offs, but um, at tackling methane from rice production by working with farmers to reduce their own costs um, and in turn getting uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions seems a much smarter use of limited funds to me than these sort of mega projects. So we are at one o'clock, but um, I will pick um, one more question. I'm, I'm just gonna ship them together. Uh, so one is from Margaret Scott. Um, she asked, um, what is the role of civil society and environmental groups um, within the countries in Southeast Asia? And then also we got a question from Quinn Levo. Um, she asked, um, how should Vietnam go about on building coalition with other Southeast Asian countries on demanding a separate loss and damage financing mechanism um, that's different from adaptation when the political feasibility is quite low um, and wealthy countries have developed um, sorry, wealthy countries 
um, have stalled progress or negotiation for decades. Yeah, I'm pretty pessimistic about loss and damage as, as being approved as a formal mechanism. I think there's just so many roadblocks to it um, that using the existing funding might be a better strategy. Um, it, might, I, I, it might just be lost effort to try to build coalitions in Southeast Asia around loss and damage. And maybe instead those coalitions could be structured in terms of increasing overall climate financing, for sure that can be advocated, you know, use existing channels, just really hold developed countries um, their feet to the fire because they said a long time ago they were gonna fund 100 billion a year and they've always fallen short of that. So making sure that that happens, but not taking the pledges and the actual you know, pipeline as, as what you wanna monitor, but where the money's coming out the other end. Um, what projects are being funded, you know, being really keeping an eagle eye on these green climate fund projects, these adaptation fund projects, are they actually tackling the most acute issues? And that's a great role for civil society, you know, where ethnic minorities, for example, indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia, um, we know that they're going to be more vulnerable. So is climate financing going to them proportionate to their numbers and their risks? Let's check, let's make sure that happens. Um, so that would be, I think, a great role for civil society um, to take on. And like these campaigns against coal, I, again, I you know, give props to the many NGOs in Southeast Asia who have really campaigned on this for the last 10 years. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's working. I think we're seeing changes because of that. And so you know, both on the mitigation side and on the adaptation side, I think those coalitions and, and even in countries like Vietnam, which are you know, very top down, they do listen to civil society. It, is, it, is, it, it has a really important role to play. And, and I'm um, really glad to see that. I, I spoke a couple of weeks ago to a pre-cop meeting of, of civil society groups in Vietnam and they gave me a lot of energy and, and hope. And, 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 I, and I, I think we're seeing it play out, yeah. That's wonderful to hear. We always like, you know, feeling hope. <laughs> the topic itself is, can be very depressing. Exactly. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of questions that came through, but unfortunately we are um, out of time. Um, Professor, do you have any sort of last minute thoughts before we wrap up? Just to say, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions and I'm sorry for that. One hour is not enough to tackle such a, a, an enormous problem. Um, but I hope that folks that are interested in this, we can stay in touch. It would be great to have a more comprehensive sort of Southeast Asia climate change network maybe. Um, and maybe that's something the New York Southeast Asia network can help us do a, a scholarly network around climate mitigation and adaptation um, would be fantastic. And we could be sharing ideas and, um, uh, folks can always email me if you had a question that I didn't answer as well. I think that's definitely something that we can, you know, definitely explore. <laughs> that um, would be great. 